Okay, but back to our lightning round. Lightning round. Okay, here we go. You're going to say yes or no to this. Okay. Soy. What kind of soy? What oh. kind of lightning round question is this? Come on. What are you talking okay. about? Okay, or I'll be specific. Or or organic, organic tofu. Uh, tempeh. Ah, I was going to say tempeh yet next. You're supposed to say yes or no. Okay, so well, are, you saying, what? are you saying no to tofu then? I'm saying compared to what? Tofu is better than about 99% of things on the world, but there's even better like tempeh. Okay, that's a good answer. I like that. Okay, so tempeh's in. Okay, so if I'm if I'm like loving soy milk and I get soy milk with organic, like whole soybeans and water only. There's no such thing as soy milk with whole soybeans and water. It's meaning a that it's not it's meaning great. that it's not soy protein isolate. It's made it's with not right. But but you have to. I mean, if you look at the fiber content, you realize. Soy milk is a very far cry from an actual soy bean. It's a processed food. Okay, but I don't food. like edamames with my cereal. Well, okay. Well, so it depends on what you use that uh, vehicle for. So in my brain, um, the only use for the so-called yellow light foods um, is to, as a vehicle to get even healthier foods in. So it depends on what you're putting that soy milk on. You're putting it on it's some crappy, sugary mess of a breakfast cereal, then it's better you not drink soy milk at all. But if you're doing it to eat your oat groats or something, well, then sign me up. Okay, okay. I knew this wasn't going to be a lightning round, but that, that's okay. Okay, so next one. Coconut oil, yes or no? No. I knew it's no. Okay, uh, we need to get this out there. This video needs to go viral ASAP. Okay, what about spirulina, blue green algae? Those are two different things. Pick one. Okay, spirulina. Bad. No. Blue green, yes, blue green algae. No. See, I knew they were both no. <laughs> okay. Avocados. I know what this has went up and down. Where are we at with avocados? Yummy. Yes. Okay. Okay, what about coffee? Uh, not as good as green tea. There we go. There we go. Okay, what? Why did you? Why do you have a whole section on hibiscus? Why are you uh, talking specifically about hibiscus tea? Because it is one of the three healthiest beverages on the planet. Number one is water. Number two is green tea or white tea, and number three is an herbal tea called hibiscus because it helps lower your blood pressure, which is a primary risk factor for death on the planet Earth. Okay, well. Good thing I have my hibiscus tea here. No, oh, oh, are we doing hibiscus tea wars here? <laughs> Do you really have hibiscus tea right now? That's hilarious. Okay, so we're getting some questions. I've been uh, too wrapped up in uh, the lightning round here. So we, we're getting all these questions. Okay, so why? So you talked about this. We'll start with this one because you talked about this in the video we saw this morning. Well, I saw it this morning. It was launched today and I saw it at 11 a.m. first thing. So, why is consuming fiber so important in weight loss? Oh, oh my God, for so many reasons. In fact, that's one of the biggest chapters in How Not to Diet because it affects weight loss in so many different ways. Um, so uh, one of the ways, because so it's it's not absorbed in the small intestine, so it can actually uh, it can actually hold on to calories within its mass that travels through the uh, intestines. You only absorb nutrients and calories from the wall of the intestine. So by keeping um, calories away from the wall, you actually um, can slip calories past um, our small intestine and. Uh, and uh, get rid of them out the other end. So eating a high fiber diet, everything you eat is discounted by about 10%. So you look at it. So if you eat a Twinkie on a high calorie diet, you, you get 10% less Twinkie calories absorbed in your body just because that fiber helps to pull calories outside of the body. Beyond that, by pulling calories down, by pulling macronutrients down to the ileum, the last part of the small intestine, you activate something called the ileal break. Because the body is thinking, wow, if I have calories all the way down the end of my small intestine, I must be full from stem to stern and dramatically dials down your appetite. You can do all sorts of interesting experiments 
We stick nine foot tubes down people's throats. You squirt down different uh, calorie sources. You can dramatically dial down not only people's appetite, but actually people's consumption of foods. They just feel full earlier with less calories. Um, and that's uh, what fiber can do. And then when fiber hits the colon, whoa, that's where the magic starts because fiber is a prebiotic, meaning that's what our good gut flora live off of. And they, we feed them, they feed us right back. They turn fiber into these short chain fatty acids like butyrate that is then absorbed through the colon wall into our bloodstream, circulate through our bodies, even up to our brain, improve our immunity, improve our um, uh, cognitive function and improve, may improve, have uh, psychological benefits, um, improves metabolism, decreases your appetite as well, slows down stomach emptying, which makes you feel fuller, longer, and on and on. Fiber's awesome, but we're not talking Metamucil or something. Um, right. You know, that psyllium fiber and Metamucil is not even fermentable by a good gut bacteria. So yeah, it can help us like a laxative, but it doesn't count in terms of these benefits. You need the fiber and the most concentrated source and that's whole plant foods, particularly whole grains and legumes, beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils. So uh, when I was watching the talk earlier, so you mentioned like when we grind up like whole grains for flowers or when we juice things. So where do smoothies fit into this? Is, is the cell wall of the plants like with these high powered blenders? What are you thinking about smoothies? Depends what you're smoothifying. Right. So, um, fruits, so fruits and some kale, let's say. Well, so the, the uh, concern would be just too rapid absorption because I mean, you could, we weren't meant to eat our calories in liquid form. And so we can overwhelm um, our homeostatic mechanisms by consuming um, uh, foods too quickly in liquid form, right? You could chug down a smoothie. So all yeah. you have to do is just sip that smoothie in the same amount of time it would take you to eat those fruits and vegetables. So if you have a blender full of fruits and veggies and that's your morning smoothie, you think, wow, if I just ate those, oh my God, it would take me like an hour to eat all those fruits and vegetables if I was just chewing away at them. Okay, well then sip that smoothie over an hour long period and then you get the best of both worlds, right? By blenderizing things, you, you break open all those cell walls, get it all that nutrition that you can never chew that good. And at the same time, um, you wouldn't uh, deal with uh, uh, any issues surrounding uh, um, uh, rapid absorption. So you can suck it through a straw, uh, make it nice and thick, add some flax seeds and kind of gel it up a little bit. Um, and then uh, suck it through a thin straw. It'll take you a while. Okay, so that's interesting. So we might increase our nutrient absorption. On the other hand, we would be missing some of the fiber though? Nope, you're not missing any oh. fiber. Blender okay, right. so even Blender though, even though you've fiber. affected the cell walls, you're still getting you get the fiber. all the fiber, um, uh, but uh, yeah. But slow so, it down. Okay, that go makes to sense. town. Go to town, but slow it down. Okay. Write that down, everybody. Okay, so uh, somebody's asking, is there anything in the plant-based world that could help deal with asthma or rhinitis? Oh my God, tons. All you have to do is type in rhinitis or asthma into nutritionfacts.org, all sorts of wonderful videos pop right up. Now, while most of those studies were done in regards to kind of seasonal allergies in terms of rhinitis, um, so there's lots of reasons that your nose can get runny. So I have lots of videos on what you can do in terms of seasonal allergies like ragweed pollen. Uh, but if your nose is running for some other reason, uh, like you have a cold or something, well, then uh, it's a kind of a different scenario. But right. uh, the typical reasons people have, you know, allergic rhinitis, um, I've got uh, videos to cover that and all the foods you can eat to help. Okay, that's great. I like that you're referring us to the videos because we're getting a lot of questions, so we won't be able great. to- Great, let's do it. Depth. Okay, so uh, what do you think about these starch-based diets? Like I know you're saying like carbs are good. We we shouldn't be ignoring carbs, but these starch-based diets, do you think it's too too many carbs or what do you think? You can't say things like carbs are good. What do you mean? Carbs are good. Okay. That's like We're saying. Okay. That's like okay. Saying, back up. Okay. Okay. Good complex carbs, not simple carbs. No, no. It's the source. There are good foods that contain carbs. There are good foods that don't contain carbs. Complex so carbs. Carbs is everything Hell. from lentils to lollipops, kidney beans to jelly beans. That's all carbs. Okay. But some Kale, are cacao, and kidney beans. Okay. Okay. So, um, so there are certainly 
uh, some of the healthiest foods on the planet, like legumes um, uh, and whole grains are high in carbohydrates, which is, uh, which is fine. But uh, most sources of carbohydrates, which is uh, added sugars and um, refined grain junk, not so good for you. Yeah, I mean, that's the anyway, thing. I mean, okay, but, think but we're doing okay. Uh, and then whether yeah. one should eat, uh, um, whether you're, if you're centering your diet around whole plant foods, I don't care what your macronutrient distribution is. I don't care if you eat a starchy diet, a fatty diet, um, uh, as long as you're, yeah, so you could be eating a diet with lots of nuts, seeds, avocados, fine. You could eat it without lots of nuts, seeds, avocado, fine. As long as you're sending your diets around whole, a variety of whole plant foods, that's the most important thing. Um, and then, you know, eat what, uh, eat what you like. Yeah, that reminds me, somebody asked this earlier. Um, it's probably a question down lower in the feed. Um, so when we were saying like uh, one of the research articles that you were going over and you had the graph and the fats and oils on the end and you're talking about the 100 oh, calories. Oh, yeah, high energy example. density, yeah. So what, what if it we're eating nuts and seeds? Oh, yeah. So, uh, so nuts and seeds are the highest energy density whole plant food there is. So that means there's lots of calories. Um, in a kind of a small volume or small mass. Um, and uh, though what's nice is that you don't actually, all those calories don't count um, as much as they would otherwise because for five reasons. And I go through, there's a, I have a, a long series of videos talking about all the five reasons why you don't get the expected weight gain from nuts. So I have studies where people add you know, one or two handfuls of nuts to their daily diet. And if you look at the calorie count, you think, oh my God, over a couple of months, you're going to get like 20,000 extra calories. Of course they gain weight, yet they don't gain the expected weight. You say, wait a second, how did 20,000 calories disappear? Um, a lot of it's substitution. They're just so satiated and they eat less food unconsciously later on or the next day. Um, uh, they actually boost your metabolism a little bit. So you have a higher kind of resting energy. Uh, you just burn more calories uh, kind of per minute just existing. Um, uh, yeah, some calories get kind of pooped out the other end because you can't chew as good unless you're doing nut butters or seed butters or something. And so a lot of those little bits of, uh, you know, oil retained or remains encased in cell walls and just comes out the other end. And there's yeah. a lot of reasons, um, why you would not, you don't see the expected weight gain you would assume just based on the calorie counts. Yeah. Okay. I remember that. Yeah. There's lots of stuff on your site about that. So um, how, just a quick, uh, how can we absorb more iron in our food? By Maybe eating vitamin C rich foods at every meal. And vitamin what are C rich foods, 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 foods at every people meal. Think, uh, vitamin C rich foods. So if people think citrus, but also tropical fruits, bell peppers, broccoli, right. those are all um, good sources. And so, uh, you know, have some fruit for dessert. And as long as it's in your stomach at the same time that iron rich foods are, Iron rich foods, whole grains, uh, nuts, and seeds, legumes, um, and uh, and have that all in your stomach at the same time. It improves iron absorption. Awesome. So just back to the nuts and seeds for a second, because someone's asking specifically: Is there recommended if we're snacking a lot on nuts and seeds? Is there recommended amounts per day? There absolutely is. I have a daily dozen checklist of all the healthiest of healthy foods. I encourage people to fit into their diets and how much I think they should get into their daily diets, ideally as an aspirational goal. And it's available as a free app on iPhone and Android. Just look for Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen. Now you can switch over to weight loss mode and I have the 21 tweaks there too. So you can graph your progress through those. Um, uh, but basically I encourage people to eat an ounce of uh, nuts and see, uh, ounce of nuts a day, which is uh, about a palm full of nuts in addition to a tablespoon of ground flax seeds. Yeah. And at the same time, if you eat more, it's still better than a lot of other foods out there. Oh, that is, that is uh, an understatement. Yeah, exactly. My mom has one of the original before the app was at one of those little whiteboards you put on your fridge to keep track. That's what I did. <laughs> yeah, you know, you made that thing. Okay, so, um, so, okay, so someone's friend was recently diagnosed with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease mm -hmm. and was advised to lose weight, which makes sense. Good. Um, do you have any specific advice about what to do or not to do aside from like our general plant-based eating? Like, is there anything specific, specific? Yeah. Yeah. So it's critically important that they cut out all alcohol or anything that uh, could potentially inflame the liver. There's a, a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, drugs 
that are safe for people with good liver function, but not so safe for people with impaired liver function like Tylenol. Um, and also, and it's critically important to avoid added sugars um, uh, um, because that can just contribute um, to the problem, avoid saturated fats. Um, so there it goes back to the coconut oil we did in the lightning round. Um, and yeah, weight loss and pull, uh, pull fat out of the liver. Okay, awesome. So somebody's wondering, you know, uh, transitioning from uh, eating meats to a plant-based diet, and if there's any obvious way we can explain why the satiate, say, I can't even say the word, <laughs> why they don't feel satiated when they're eating like, or even plant-based with lots of fats, but more when they're eating meats versus eating plant-based. Why don't they get that same feeling of because they're eating fewer calories, right? I mean, so plant foods are so calorically dilute on average that you can't eat the same amount of food. I mean, so people, you know, have been habituated to look down at a dinner plate and see just a certain volume of food. And you say, oh, well, that's what dinner is. That's what lunch is, about this much food. But no, you have to completely break out of that paradigm. You can't eat the same amount of food because you lose too much weight. I mean, you, you know, if you actually add up the calories, you think you're full, you're stuffed, but you're just, you're running calorie deficiency. No wonder you're not feeling satiated. That's your body saying, wait a second, where's all the calories? So you may have to eat, if you get too full, you have, may have to eat more frequently. Um, you may have to add calorie dense foods to your diet, like nuts and seeds yeah. and dried fruit and smoothies and avocados, things like that to boost up the calorie intake because otherwise, you know, people can eat the same amount of food as they were before and, you know, uh, you know, cut their calorie counts in half unknowingly. So they're cutting a thousand calories out of their daily diet. And that's actually the, so there was a study. In fact, I talked about it um, in the video that went up this morning where they just took a bunch of regular people um, and just switched them over to healthier foods and said, eat as much as you want. Like we're not saying, we're just saying eat these foods instead of these foods. Um, and so they ate to satiety, they ate as much as they wanted, um, but they had, because they switched them to, to an emphasis on whole plant foods, they cut a thousand calories out of their daily diets without even trying. They were just eating a thousand calories less. And that was sustainable day after day, they were eating a thousand calories less because there was just so much food. And that's one of the benefits of plant-based eating. Yeah, that's why you gotta, you gotta have nuts in your purse. It's just a rule. <laughs> You got to carry that stuff around. Or have you ever been to a restaurant and you order what they call the big salad? And you're like, this is not big. That's right. No, you want a mixing bowl salad. Yeah, that's yeah, the that's you what know. I do at home. <laughs> and to, you know, then you can watch a whole, you can watch one of the Dr. Gregor's DVDs for like two hours and eat the salad. Chew it. Absolutely. Ah, yeah, chew it slowly. It so the volume wise, you're fine. And there you go. That's what I do. Great. Okay, so um, so somebody's asking about lung and respiratory function. So um, maybe you've said something about white mushrooms assisting with this, but they're wondering, other than white mushrooms, what foods or lifestyle recommendations for improving lung and respiratory function? So I think the white mushrooms was for decreasing upper respiratory tract infections among children. Um, oh, okay. so it, but that was an immune boosting effect. Um, rather than a lung function. Uh, but I do have a study that's talking about COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, as well as asthma, um, and showing an improvement in, uh, in lung function uh, with, uh, with basically fruit and vegetable intake. You randomize people to eat more fruits and vegetables, and you can significantly improve lung function. And this is for people with normal lung function or with people with impaired lung function. Um, and whether it's the antioxidant effects of the, or the, uh, the anti-inflammatory effects, we're not exactly sure, but this is something that you can reliably um, uh, test. And it's as simple as eating more fruits and vegetables. There you go. So we could just say all the questions, eat more fruits and vegetables, goodbye. But ah. let's, keep, <laughs> let's keep going because we, this is a good question. Um, I remember, so this brings us back to, somebody's asking about DHA. EPA supplements yeah. and where to get it from and all this. And we've seen some stuff in the news about fi fish oil, got to eat fish again, got to eat fish oil. And, uh, and anyways, I know you're going to say that I have a follow-up question. So tell us about what you think about DHA, EPA supplements and uh, fish oil and all that. Yeah. So I encourage people to consider taking 250 milligrams of preformed DHA and or EPA 
um, uh, every day from a pollutant free source. And so that has to be an algae based source just because we've so polluted our planet. And even, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, um, they do this uh, distil distillation process um, to try to purify fish oil, you still can't get rid of um, all, the, uh, all the toxins. And so um, uh, the pollutant free sources basically it's either algae or yeast based sources. Um, the, and, uh, and you can just, you know, buy whichever is cheapest because most of the, all the algae based sources I think are made by one company called Martech International. They just sell it under different brand names. And so, um, but, uh, and this is not for cardiovascular health, but for cognitive health, particularly uh, later on. Okay, so since you and I are old pals, I know you remember me asking you this follow-up question back in 2010. Oh, yeah. So the, so the follow-up- You don't even have to say it, because I just remember it. Oh, yeah, but, go ahead. Uh, but for the benefit of everyone else. Okay, so the follow-up question is, we already covered earlier that blue-green algae is bad, right? So tell us why uh, algae fish oil, how it's different. That's like, the, the, it's, it's, there's like thousands of different types of algae. So blue green algae um, is bad for you because it creates toxins, but the, the DHA is derived from um, something called golden algae that doesn't make toxins. And so, I mean, exactly. you know, it's okay, like well, saying- so all I mean, you and me, but everybody else is like, how can algae be bad and good? Because Right, right, no, right. That's like saying, oh, you said, uh, you told me to eat plants but what about the strychnine plant? So I'm not gonna eat plants. Well, no, there's all sorts of different kinds of plants. Some are good, some are not good, you know. Okay, well, some of us aren't as familiar with uh, all the different kinds of algae, you know. Everybody Don't, knows uh, all the different kinds of donuts you can get, but not algae. It's probably true. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. So uh, let's see, what else have we got here? So here's another question about water, because we know we should drink a lot of water and, yep. and especially when we're, eating high plant-based, like if we're eating lots of fruits and vegetables, we know we're getting 70 to 95% water in some of those. But when we're just talking about glasses of water, do you have any suggestions around eating the water before or eating, before you eat, drinking the water before, drinking the water after, is there a, a yes or no to the before and after and how much? Absolutely, water right. before a meal. So water before that meal, in the video. it has to be cold water and it has to have nothing in it. Cold, so no, how cold? I avoid cold. What? Well, no, no. Well, I mean, this is for the, well, for the weight loss benefits. Ah, uh, okay. If you don't care about weight loss benefits, eat water however you want. Okay, so if it is for weight loss though, it should be cold. It should be cold with nothing in it um, and before, uh, before a meal. So uh, one study found that Men and women given the simple advice, just drink a glass of water before each meal, lost weight 44% faster than those without that simple inf instruction. So uh, no lemon wedge, no drop of chlorophyll. No lemon wedge, no drops of nothing. But okay. again, this is just for the Sorry, weight loss. Sorry, this clock is over. I don't know how to proceed now. My whole life has just been thrown no, up. No, 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 but then, uh, no, but that's not all the water you drink. That's <laughs> no, just before that's the meals. You still got to drink all this other water and that you can, Flavor like crazy. All right, all right. Okay, I'm back, I'm back. I just needed a second. Okay, so then what about after the meal? Are we drinking water? How, how long do we wait? I usually don't because I don't want to dilute my digestive juices. Well, I mean, well, look, I mean, you don't want to exceed um, uh, four cups per hour because that, then your kidneys can't get rid of it. And of course, if you have kidney problems or heart failure, you may not want to even drink that much. Um, but, uh, but so, I mean, you can't drink all the, you have to spread the water and take out throughout the day, but, uh, yeah, but uh, I refer people to that, my hydration chapter and how not to diet for all the nitty gritty details. All right. All right. Okay. So, uh, we have someone who's been vegan for many years and are oil free, no processed sugar. They've been doing whole foods, like low to no processed foods, they're still suffering from candida. Is there anything outside of diet that you're aware of that could be causing what the kind candida? Of, the vaginal candida or oral candida? What's going on? They're not here, so I don't know. <laughs> well, so those are very different diseases. Uh, or, so Sarah or, says it was a male, so let's assume it's not vaginal. Okay, well then, then still there's thrush, there's intestinal candidiasis, there's a whole candida. Okay, so let's get to, let's see if they can uh, provide us uh, the specific candida and we'll go to another question for a moment. Okay. Okay, so. Uh, we only got time for like one more. 
Oh, what time is it? Oh, geez. Oh, is your treadmill telling you time's up? You know, I didn't even refer to the treadmill because every time I see you, you're on the treadmill, but everybody else is probably like, what is going on? Where is he running to? I am just <laughs> leisurely walking. Okay. Is there, is there stuff on your website about Candida? Oh yeah. Okay. So then maybe we'll cover that there. And uh, so is there anything, you know, people are always trying to not plant plant-based diets and they'll, they'll mention allergies or this or that. Is there any ever like something that somebody can throw at you where really a plant-based diet isn't good for them? Um, uh, someone on dialysis has to be really careful. So if you have no kidney function whatsoever, um, then you have to be really careful about your potassium intake and your phosphorus intake. Um, and uh, so, I mean, for most people, oh my God, we're not getting, 98% of us don't get enough potassium. We need to go out of our way to eat more greens and sweet potatoes and beans. And, um, you know, we have severely potassium deficient diets. But you take someone with dialysis, and their body can't get rid of potassium, they can run into really serious problems. And so, uh, I mean, it doesn't mean they can eat a plant based diet, um, but they would have to do it with a renal dietitian to make sure um, it's just a little more tricky. Okay, so because we're running out of time, I'm just going to do, uh, there was a couple things that came up that they wanted to be added to the lightning round. So amla berry, do you know yes. amla berry? Yes. Yes. Moringa leaf. No, that's a surprise. That's a shocker. Wow. Wow. And what about chlorella? Yes. All right. Ta-da! Well, thank you so much for taking the time out while you were thank exercising. You everybody. I'm oh, looking very much forward to coming back to Toronto. Well, you're coming. You are coming. You're, so are, are you promising live right now that you'll be back to Toronto one day? Oh, well, one day, yeah. But uh, first we have to, there's this pesky little, uh, little uh, virus we got to get rid of first. Yeah, and unfortunately, you're on the wrong side of the border, too. You can't even hang out at a social distance with us right now. Mm, sorry, but uh, you're welcome to visit anytime. Okay. Well, thank you so much. So everybody, uh, check out nutritionfacts.org. We didn't get to some of the questions. Um, Candida, you can check that out. Uh, intestinal Candida, they say. So check that out on nutritionfacts.org. And uh, you can go to our bookstore. Uh, so when, when you're on the Veg Food Fest uh, website, there's a link to the bookstore and you can get How Not to Die, How Not to Diet, How Not to Die Cookbook, and How to Survive a Pandemic. And uh, don't forget, a lot of you got your memberships at Veg Fest last year in person. So don't forget to renew your memberships because we really need your support in order to keep going so that we can have Dr. Greger back, hopefully next year, September 2021. So People thank you. Okay, we'll see you again. Bye.